we've been in a series called Scent Life Summer. Uh, we say here at Life Church, and some of you may be wearing your shirt right now that says Live a Bold Life. That's kind of our slogan here. And that's really how we say our mission statement, Live a Bold Life in Jesus. Uh, Jesus' commission to make disciples, that's how we say it here, that living a bold life is a life that is making disciples. But we believe that each of us are sent. And so what does it mean to live a bold life? We believe that it means living in certain bold habits. If you wanted to get healthy, you would have to live in certain habits, right? You would need to eat right, uh, you would need to exercise, you'd probably need to eat kale, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you'd have to eat kale. By the way, did you know that kale used to just be a garnish? We didn't used to eat it. Did you know that? Do y'all remember Pizza Hut a long time ago when they would have the, the buffet of the salad bar? And kale was what was in between everything that you would eat. Do you remember that? It was like the garnish. So someone one day picked up the garnish and said, hey, this is good. I don't like that person. And they're wrong. They're wrong. It is not good, right? And so, anyway, I digress, but we would have to live in these certain habits of eating healthy. And so, in the same way, to live a bold life, we believe that we have to live in these bold habits. We got together as a staff and said, what does that mean? What does that look like in the everyday life? And it's these four things. Be with and bless others. The O is observe and obey the Spirit. The L is learn and live Jesus, and the D is demonstrate and declare the kingdom. And our hope and our prayer is that we as followers of Christ would live in these habits in such a way that it becomes intuitive. This is just who we are. This is how we live, no matter what situation or circumstance or location we are ever at. Because we believe that a bold life is a sent life. And we see that from Scripture, that we have a sent and sending God. We have God the Father who sent Jesus the Son, right? We have God the Father, Jesus the Son, who sent the Holy Spirit. We have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who have now sent us as the church. So to kind of pull this all together, we say uh, we are sent where we live, work, learn, and play. We've been called to live a bold life that is a sent life living in these bold habits. So today we're talking about the second bold habit. Observe and obey the Spirit. I'm going to talk about the first half of that, observing the Spirit. And so I want to start off with a question, and you have two choices. Here's the question. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have Jesus beside you or the Holy Spirit inside you? Which would you rather have? Would you rather have Jesus beside you or the Holy Spirit inside? inside you. Now, when I say Jesus beside you, I mean, hey, he's walking with you. Now, you're the only one that gets him, right? Because he chose to be limited as a man, so you're the only one to get him. Nobody else gets him. But that would be pretty cool, right? Have y'all met Jesus? Jesus, show him how you walk on water. You're going to love this, right? I mean, would that be great? If you said Jesus beside you, then you need to know that Jesus disagrees with you. <laughs> because in Scripture, when he was meeting at the Last Supper with the apostles... And telling them again that he's going to the cross and they still didn't quite get it. In the midst of that conversation, he says to them in John 16, 7, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He later goes on and elsewhere and says that the Holy Spirit will teach us in all things. It will remind us of everything that Jesus has said to us. That the Holy Spirit will give us what to say when we need to live uh, out our faith or share our faith. And then he goes on to say that you will do what I am doing and you'll do even greater things if I go. Now that's pretty powerful words to say. Because the Holy Spirit is now able to indwell every single one of us as followers of Christ, no matter where we live, no matter what time we live in. And so he's able to indwell all of, uh, all of us at the same time. Now fast forward, Jesus has died, uh, been buried, and he's risen again. And now he's appeared to his followers, and on one occasion he told them this in Acts 1.8. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They were in Jerusalem and he worked out from there. So he's saying to them that I'm sending the Holy Spirit and it will give the church the ability to complete my mission. And then we move to Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at that passage today. Start in verse 1. It's also in our app. You can pull up the outline. And of course, it'll be on the screen as well. But Acts 2 is the coming of the Holy Spirit on the church. In verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, it says they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and then came to rest on each of them. It says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. In verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, it says a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. We jump down to verse 14. It says, and then as this happens, Peter stood up with the 11 apostles. Judas is gone by now raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. And then Peter goes on to really preach kind of the first sermon to the church that is forming there. And he tells them about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the salvation he has come, and that they are to repent. And then we jump down to 41, and it says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. So this is the Holy Spirit coming on the church. Jesus has said it was going to happen. He said why it was going to happen, and then it happens. And there's several things we need to notice from this. First of all, notice the way the Spirit came on them. It, it talks about the sound of a blowing, violent wind. Now, in a group this size, it's probably a good chance that you've seen a tornado or heard a tornado, or I hope you haven't been impacted by one, but what do they say a tornado, tornado sounds like? What do they say? Like a train. So this wasn't some little gentle breeze, you know, cue the fan and your hair blows around, it tickles your nose. No, it's not that, that one at all. This was a violent sound of a, of a blowing wind. This picture of power and, and of movement. Now what's interesting is in the Old Testament Hebrew, the word ruah, and in the New Testament Greek, the word pneuma that is translated spirit can also be translated as breath and wind. And so it would make perfect sense that the Holy Spirit would come sounding like a wind, right? Beginning to fill uh, his people. But the other thing that it talks about is tongues of fire. And so this idea of fire coming down on them. In the Old Testament, when God's presence descended on a place, he did so in the form of a flame or fire. Moses saw what kind of bush? A burning bush. The Israelites were guided in, uh, when they were leaving from uh, being enslaved by the Egyptians by a pillar of fire. On Mount Sinai, when Moses got the Ten Commandments, uh, Mount Sinai was consumed in fire. When King Solomon commissioned the temple, the fire of God settled into the Holy of Holies. And so in the Old Testament, the fire of God often produced fear, and those that came in contact with it many times died. But now, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he has absorbed the fullness of God's wrath and his fire, and now that fire rests on us through the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? A fire that could kill you now indwells you because of Christ's sacrifice for us. This means that the God of untouchable holiness now lives in the heart of us. And so you have these two pictures of this wind and this fire. That is the Holy Spirit that is within us. And all of it speaks to movement, him sending us out. He also did a miracle in this situation. He caused a bunch of people that didn't understand each other's languages, all types of languages, to understand each other's language. They heard as if it was their own language. And of course, Peter, being a preacher, said this would be a good opportunity to do a message. 
right? Because no matter what language I preach it in, everyone will be able to understand it. And so you have this miracle of the gospel going out to all of the nations. And so the Holy Spirit's first action was to empower the church to fulfill his mission. Now, one other significant thing I wanted to mention was Pentecost. Pentecost, uh, Penta, 50, this was 50 days after the Passover. And it was a harvest festival. And so to the Israelites, the Passover was very significant. Because it was the final plague that God brought uh, in Egypt to free them from Egyptian slavery, to free the Israelites. God said, God told, through Moses said, Pharaoh, this is the final plague. God's going to take your firstborn. But he went to the Israelites and said, sacrifice a lamb and take the blood and put it over your doorway. And when the death angel comes to take the firstborn, he will pass over your house. And so this is a precursor, obviously, as we can, can see now, of Jesus being that final sacrifice. So you have the Passover that's kind of connecting what Jesus did on the cross. And then you have 50 days later, the result of that, the harvest of the church being formed. Isn't that a beautiful thing? 50 days later, and now this is the harvest. And so it came on Pentecost. All of this is significant. And if you were Jewish, you would have understood all of these things that I just explained to you. You would have understand that the very word for spirit also means wind and breath. So it would make sense the Holy Spirit would come in a violent wind. You would understand what, the, what fire would represent because that always represented God's presence. And now that presence is now on us. And we don't burn up. And so he's empowering us through this. So the Holy Spirit has come to direct us in the mission of Jesus. And of course, that's just the, the bold life that we're talking about. Now, what's interesting is the very word in the Greek, ekklesia, that we translate church, it actually carries this idea of an assembly or a gathering, and within it, it has the word of the verb to call out or to call. And so, literally, ekklesia means the called out ones. The called out assembly, the called out group, we're called out to something, to the mission. But what happened in the Middle Ages was a terrible thing. Believers began to think of the church as a place and not as a movement, not as a group of called out ones to something. And our word that we use for church today actually is from a German word that means Kirche. And you know what Kirche means? A sacred place. And so by the time we made our English translations, because the church had become a sacred place and no longer a movement, that word church was used. <laughs> William Tyndale devoted his life to translating the Bible into English. And in his translation, he translated Ecclesia's congregation to try to move this back, the fact that we're a people. We don't go to church. We are the church. We're to be the church. And this is how ingrained this is. When I typed what I just said in Google Docs, the phrase, be the church, Google Doc wanted to correct it to say, be at church. This is how in, it, got the, it got the blue squiggly line. You know what I'm talking about? And you click on it. This needs to be changed to be at the church. And I'm like, no, I know what I said. I know what I said, Google Doc, Mr. Google, right? That is how ingrained it is that the church for us, for many, has just become a sacred place where religious goods and services are consumed. This could not be further from what God originally intended. How did we get from Acts 2? How did we get from Ex Ecclesia to this? You see, we are not a curse, but an Ecclesia. So the Holy Spirit moves us into mission. Well, as we talk about the habit of observing the Spirit, there's a couple of things we need to remember before we jump in. The first one is this, is that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God work inseparably. They are not to be separated, that, that they work together. In other words, the Holy Spirit will not lead us in a direction that is counter to what God's word would say. 
So the Holy Spirit will never contradict, violate, or diminish the word of God that has already been given to us. Why would God give us his word and then through his Holy Spirit contradict it? He would not. And so that's always the check. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says all scripture is God breathed. I love that. God breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be fully equipped for every good work. And so while the Holy Spirit never contradicts the Word of God, those work together, we do need to remember that the Holy Spirit does speak into our experience. And it is often in unexpected ways to give us specific guidance, strength, or insight at particular times. And so you have the Word of God that the Holy Spirit's not going to contradict, and yet the Word of God still speaks into our life. It's been said that we read scripture, but it is the word of God that brings it alive into the life of Keith Abbott, who's right here, who's in Austin, Texas area right now, who lives in this neighborhood, who works here. And so the Holy Spirit is able to bring that alive. Jesus, uh, when he was visiting with a religious leader of the day uh, by the name of Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus actually came to him under the cloak of night and said, can you tell me a little more about what you're doing here? He was fascinated by Jesus, but he was a religious leader of the day, and the majority of them were like, Jesus is a heretic. But he was curious, and this is a conversation where he says, probably the most famous verse in Scripture, Jesus says, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, right? He gave his one only son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. In that same conversation, this is what Jesus said to him about the Spirit. In 3.8, he says, the wind blows, again, wind, right? Wind, spirit, breath. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. He says, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I want you to think about that. There's a, there's a mysterious nature here, isn't it? There's a mysterious nature to the Holy Spirit, and you have the clarity of of God's Word, and then you have the mystery of the Spirit, and you're like, I don't really know how these go together. But they do. That's the joyous, mysterious, dynamic piece of the Christian life. In the book of Acts, we see at least 36 times that the Holy Spirit guided people, but what's interesting is, is there's no standard. (laughs) It's always different. How many burning bush experiences were there? One. So if people were like, hey, I'm waiting for my shrubs to catch on fire. Where's God? Why didn't he speak to me in this way? Because he's always doing it different because it's not predictable. And yet he moves. And so there's no standard way. What's interesting is Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he doesn't even tell us always how he spoke, just that he did. A couple of examples is... The Holy Spirit forbid Paul and Silas for, from going to certain places on their missionary journey. And we're not told how. They were just like, we were going to go here and the Spirit wouldn't let us. But we're not told how he did that. Paul was told not to fear Roman soldiers who were coming to question him. Church leaders were validated for instructions that they gave to new believers. In other words, they gave these instructions and said, and the Holy Spirit confirmed that this was good instruction to them. We see Philip being told to go stand near a stranger, and ultimately he led that stranger to the Lord. We see Paul being affirmed to stay in Philippi due to the work in Lydia, the work that God was doing in Lydia. We see Paul being told not to go to Jerusalem. We see some church members giving an offering, and they lied about some things about it, and the church was given insight about it by the Holy Spirit. There is a mystery to it. And the precise nature of the Spirit's breaking into our life can never be scripted, demanded, predicted, or even anticipated. But yet he speaks into it. Now I know it sounds like I said a lot of things just then that said absolutely nothing. And you're going, you haven't given any guidance here, Keith. You just talked about a lot of things that could or might or would or should or but, but that's the Holy Spirit. But what we do know in the end, what we do know to be true is that he speaks and he moves to us. And even if you talk to, 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 if you talk to other brothers and sisters in Christ, the way he speaks and moves may be a little bit different. There are going to be commonalities. But it is grounded in Scripture. It's not just a free-for-all. You don't just look at your alphabets and something spelling and you're like, that's from the Spirit. No, it's just the way the milk moved, the, the, everything. Do y'all know what alphabets are? The younger ones are going, I don't even know what you're talking about. Older ones, y'all know, don't you? Don't you know, part of a balanced breakfast, maybe only 
of a balanced breakfast if you need sugar in your diet. But so a quick example, a, quick, a few quick examples is, is where the word outlines mission, the spirit inspires vision. Where the word sets expectations, the spirit inv- inspires dreams. Where the word describes the character of God, the spirit pulls us into his emotions. Where the word provides the content, the spirit illuminates the conviction. Where the word commands us to obey, the spirit beckons us to follow. Do you see the difference there? Do you see a little bit of the nuance there of how they work together? That, that, that we read God's word and, and it's just words on a page. Yes, it's living and breathing, but, what, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings those things out, living and breathing into our life. It's interesting that if you look at the times and the ways the Spirit moved in Scripture, it was always connected to mission. It was always connected to mission. You know, a lot of times we're like, Holy Spirit, you know, should I go to McDonald's or Burger King? Just guide me. Neither. Some place with kale. Okay. Right? And, and, and I'm being silly, and I'm sure that's not what you're asking the Holy Spirit to do, but, but sometimes we're just asking the Holy Spirit for something that just impacts us and isn't necessarily even connected to mission. I know you like the floor, Brian says this all the time, I know you like the floor plan of the house that you finally moved into, but you not, do you not think God wa- wants to use you and gu- guide you through his Holy Spirit in your neighborhood that you're in? He does. So I want to talk a little bit about observing the Spirit and what that involves. And I want to really work off of a verse that's, it's, that many of you may have already memorized. Your kids are actually memorizing this verse in the kids' classes. It's Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. And this is a, a, a proverb from King Solomon. And this is what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's an all-in kind of thing. And he says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit or surrender to him. And then what will he do? Here's the promise. He will make your path straight. So we need to trust the Lord with all of our heart. We need to not try to figure it out ourselves. because here's the deal. What happens is, is when we try to get our own understanding over here, we need to say, you know what? I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. And here's what begins to happen. Before you know it, God has changed your understanding, and this is how you are to see things. Have you ever had that happen before? You're like over here saying, God, I don't understand this and this. And he's like, stop trying to understand that and just come over here. Wow, this thing really opened up now. I see things differently. I understand I am a sent person. Because you got to remember the context of all of these bold habits is to those that are not yet followers of Christ. This is all connected to mission. And so what this verse is helping us see is that we need to avail ourselves of every means God wants to guide us. Because I believe that no matter where you are, no matter what you do, no matter what your gifting is, God wants to use all of it to move you to be a sent person and living a bold life. And so here's the first one. Observing the Spirit involves prayerfully pursuing God's Word. Now, of course, I'm going to say that one first. I've already talked about it. This is the anchor of all the others. For us as followers of Christ, meditating and studying Scripture should be like breathing for us. Let me say that again. Meditating and studying Scripture and reading Scripture should be like breathing. We should inhale Scripture and exhale a life like Jesus. It should be our number one influence over Fox News, uh uh-oh, over CNN, pick your choice, over social media, and the expert that failed science but all of a sudden is a doctor on Facebook. You know what I'm talking about? It should be what we inhale constantly and what influences us. And prayer should accompany it. Prayer is not to ever be separated from Scripture. Before we even go to Scripture, you say, Lord, you want to speak to me today. Through your Holy Spirit, help me to see what are you saying to me? What do you want to do in me and through me? And can I tell you something? Those are not separated. The things he does in you are not just for you. It's also so he can do something through you. You never see in scripture where he's like, and I did this work in these people, and then, that, and then they died. No. No. You, I did this work in these people, and an outgrowth of that was I did this through them. 
Those are always, always connected. I heard someone say one time that we need to let the scriptures read us. When we read the scriptures and as we're praying and as, as the Holy Spirit is speaking, this should be a dialogue. If you end up reading in Matthew 5, 43 through 44, where it says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, you should be asking yourself, man, who do I hate? Who has brought harm to me? And how can I pray for them? And how can I love them? Don't you think the Holy Spirit would want to bring that out if we're open to it? Or do you think he wants you to just breeze through that and go, well, that doesn't apply to me? That's how living and breathing, that's how the Holy Spirit wants to use his word. So we need to ask, how is the Spirit through the scriptures leading me to live a bold life to those I'm sent? Observing the Spirit also involves strategically living in my spiritual gifts. God has gifted each of us a little differently. We have different personalities, we have different spiritual gifts, we have different stories, experiences, different abilities. Some of you are naturally good at things and you don't realize that everyone's not naturally good at that, but that's something that God has placed in you. Some of you are passionate about things. Some of you also, I would ask you, what have people around you affirmed you in saying, God has used you in my life in this way? Those can help you better understand of how God has created you. Now, we have on our app, on our uh, Life Church app, uh, you can go there and it's called Shape. Uh, we've mentioned it before, but it's still on there. And you can actually discover what your spiritual gifts are. And it's, it's, it's more than just spiritual gifts. But you can discover more about who God created you to be. And the reason this is important is because God wants to send you as you are, out of who you are. And the truth is, is God wants, he sent all of us. So the end game mission is the same for all of us, but it's going to look a little different for all of us. So we need to say, how has the Spirit gifted me to live a bold life to those I'm sent? The fire, there was a fire chief who had new recruits. And so he brought all the recruits together and he said, these are your assignments. You're going to be the driver. You're going to run the siren. You're going to be over the hose. And you're going to be what's called the tiller. That's that steering wheel in the back. Wouldn't that be fun to do? I guess you have to, do you have to steer opposite of the front? How many... How many trucks do they wreck before you learn that job, right? I mean, it's just, but anyway, so the tiller, the person in the back. So he gave them their assignments, and then he circled back to him and he said, all right, tell me what your job is. The first one said driver, the second one said siren, the third one said hose, and then the final one said, I'm the tiller. And he said, you are all incorrect. Your job is to put out fires and save lives. You need to understand that it doesn't matter where you are on the truck. God wants to use you to live a bold life and to make disciples. And what you'll learn is, is as you're making disciples, he will make you a disciple. Observing the Spirit also involves carefully reading God's arrangement of circumstances. His arrangement of circumstances. God speaks through our circumstances too. Again, it needs to be checked with all the other things that we've talked about. But who in your current circumstances do you know that is not yet a follower of Christ? Is it someone that you're on a work project with? Is it someone in your class if you go to school? Is it a family that's part of the uh, baseball team that you travel with on the weekends with your kids? Is it a neighbor that you share tools with? You know how that works, right? I don't need to own a chainsaw. I just need a neighbor that owns a chainsaw. Do you ever do that before? Right? But that can be how relationships happen, right? We should consistently be watching and praying. Now, I hear people say, well, Keith, I live like this all day. And that's great. We should. But I call that reactive mission. And what I mean by that is, is okay, you go through your day and you know, people are like, well, I know my barista, Susan. Well, what do you know about her? Well, she makes a good latte. Okay, all right, that's great. And so maybe you're kind to, to Susan in your normal schedule and you leave a, a, a good tip and maybe you say, how's your day doing? That's great, continue to do that. We should leave a wake of blessing as followers of Christ no matter where we go. But I want to encourage you not to just be reactive where you just kind of flow in and out of people's lives. Be proactive with those that you regularly come in contact with of pursuing a relationship and just taking the next natural step. 
We don't accidentally live sin. We don't. I mean, we need to be intentional. And that's a good word for all of us to have. Because if we're not, you know how it is. You just get caught up in all the day-to-day things that are going on. And I, what I'm trying to tell you is, God's will for you is not that you just make it through another day. And we've all said that prayer. I've said that prayer. God, this is just where I'm at. Just help me to make it through another day. The bar, he has so much more for us. And here's what I've learned. When I can see that higher level thing, all these other things kind of fade a little bit. Have you ever noticed that? You know, if, if, if you're just trying to make it through your day, then a flat tire is like, this may be the worst day of my life. And then next week, it's something else. My latte by Susan was not good. This may be the worst day of my life, right? And you just keep replacing, and you're like, man, you've lived a pretty good life if a flat tire is your worst day, really? We escalate it, right? Because it's not put in perspective of, you know what, this is how. And isn't this what God does? He kind of pulls us away from the trees, and he goes, oh, it's an entire forest. Okay. I see it. I can see the path now. This is what he's called us to, and what we'll do is put all these things in perspective, and as we go, we'll begin to see things very differently. Somebody pulled over and helped me with my flat tire. He's a nice person. I told him, man, I really appreciate that. I want to live in a world where we, where we help each other's flat tires, and I want to be that person. I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's a total change of perspective rather than I was late to my meeting or whatever it may be. And so he wants to speak and move through uh, circumstances, and we need to be proactive. Maybe you need to join a, a book club or a young mom's group, or maybe the person you're on the work project with, you need to, before meeting or after meeting, you start saying, hey, how are you doing? My name is Keith. I, you know, we're going to be in this project for a while. Where are you from? That kind of thing. And then that, that let it go at the pace that it goes. The results are the Lord's. And so where in my circumstances is the Spirit giving direction to live a bold life to those that I'm sent? Observing the Spirit also involves cautiously discerning insights. Now again, all of these need to be checked with one another. But as we begin to build relationships with those that are not yet followers of Christ... We're going to begin to hear their story, and God's going to bring certain things out as we get to know them. And the way I like to describe it is, is if this is a graph of someone's life, and let's just see the biggest, let's just say the biggest hurts or the high points, and this is their graph, I always think to myself, how does the gospel lay over that, and what are the first touch points for that person? One of the questions that we train uh, when we do our Scent Life Lab is we train people to say, what, would, what is good news to them? You know, the gospel is what Jesus did as his death, burial, resurrection of Christ, but it's also everything else, that he's restoring all things, that we were made in the image of God, and we turned from him, and, and he's, he's making all things right. He's bringing rec, uh, reconciliation. He's bringing beauty, restoration, all of those things. Here's an example. You begin to build a relationship with someone, and they, be, they start sharing their story, and you realize, man, they never had a father. Or their father abandoned them when they were really young. So what would be good news to them from the gospel? That we have a heavenly father who will never leave us. Would that not be good news to them? And so that's the inroad. And and again, we're not moving towards a presentation. We're listening. And this is not one conversation. It's a relationship. And they're not a project. They're a person. And and, and we're going to, through that relationship, show and tell, just like when we were at school, right? The gospel. They're going to hopefully see it in our life, and we'll have opportunities to be able to tell that. And so as we get this insight, we're now adding that to our prayer list. Lord, Lord, I, I see this need in this person's life, and I just pray that, that uh, you would work and move in their life in this way. I pray that there would be an opportunity for me to share. And, and the, we've already been told by Jesus that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say in the right way to say them in that moment. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the Holy Spirit showing me in the lives of those that I'm sent to? that guides how I can live a bold life to them. And then finally, observing the Spirit involves continually receiving counsel from my community. We were not meant to live sent alone. Look around. You're not the only person in here. We've all been sent. We were meant to go together. And one of the beauties of the gathering like this, I think, and I don't know if you, if this is, if you think about this or not, But it is pretty awesome to sit in this room together 
and look around and go, I don't know everyone, but I see lots of different nationalities. I see lots of different ages, people from different places. And yet here we are together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And just your presence says, we're on this together. We're in this together. Is there a little bit of comfort with that? Just to kind of look around and lift up our voices together to the same God? To know that, by golly, <laughs> there are others that are fighting the good fight too. Because sometimes we think we're alone, don't we? But God didn't create us alone, did he? We didn't spring up in a field as a standalone person. We were brought up into families. And sometimes that worked out well and sometimes it didn't because we're all sinful human beings. But the family of God is what we're a part of. That's our identity. And all other identities fall under that. And so the question we need to ask is, how is the Spirit using my community to encourage or support me in living a bold life to those I'm sent? How awesome would it be to be able to meet regularly with other brothers and sisters in Christ that are living sent in this same way in their context? And you can come together and you can talk about what God's doing and talk about the sticking points, talk about the insights you've gained, the ups and downs of the relationship. Hey, we, we've been trying to invite our neighbors over for three months, and, and, and they were coming over to eat, and then they canceled at the last minute. So I'm, I'm discouraged. But you know what? We're going to continue on in a relationship. Or, hey, I've, I've reached out to Joe, and, and, and man, we've been talking for a long time, and all of a sudden the, the, the conversation turned, and he, he shared something that was going on in his life, and I immediately realized I know what good news is to him. And then you begin to pray about how that good news can go to them. We need the encouragement. We need the support. Because quite frankly, we won't do it by ourselves. Let's just be honest. Just like New Year's resolutions, this is why we don't tell anybody, right? <laughs> Nobody knew I didn't keep it except me. So as we close... I want to give you kind of the, the, a call to action that we've been giving every time and then also one specific to today. But this is not going to have any feet if we don't do these things, I believe, or something like this. First of all, you need to pick a context. Is it where you live, in your neighborhood, where you work, where you learn, where you play? Well, Keith, shouldn't we be Jesus in all of those? Yes, we should. I'm just asking you to be intentional. So pick one and then write down three people this would be your sent list, that you know that are not yet followers of Christ. Well, Keith, I don't know. I don't know if they are or not. Well, write them down for now, okay? And then at some point, you know, maybe you'll be able to find that out and you can replace it with someone who's uh, later and you never have to talk to them again. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But this is, but, but my focus is, is, the focus here is those that are not yet followers of Christ. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know anybody that's not yet a follower of Christ, then I don't mean to offend you, but if that's true, you have isolated yourself, yourself in a way that God never intended you to. He didn't say, just go hang out at the church, just go hang out in Bible studies every day of the week and not have any relationships with those that are not yet followers of Christ. What good is it for all the light to hang out just together? We've been called to go out. And so we need that support of one another as we live these bold habits with one another, but we're living it to those that are out here. And so if you're isolated, maybe you need to push yourself out and say, hey, maybe I need to, to, to be looking with these eyes. And for a lot of us, we're just going through our day. We're not even thinking in this way. But this is our identity. And so then once you write down those names, I want you to just start praying for them. Because something will begin to happen. Something will begin to happen when you begin to pray. You begin to see things. The Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you. And so here's the specific call to action for this week. I want you to observe what the Spirit is doing in your relationship with those you are sent, and I want you to write it down. That's all I'm asking, just write it down. Some of you have been in relationships for a long time, and you, and, and you already have about 10 things that you're thinking. I know their story, and I know these things, and I know I can pray for them in this way, and I know that, that the, the good news, this would be good news to them. Write it down, be intentional, and see where the Spirit takes it as He leads you. So again, I said, don't do this alone. We have what are called uh, four, four, three, two groups, four bold habits lived by three people, and you meet up twice a month. You can go to that QR code, and it will show you in one page, front and back, how to do a four, three, two group, and you, all you have to do is find two more people, 
It also has a form where you can sign up so that we know you're in a 432 group and we want to reach out to you and kind of support you and, and coach you and that type of thing. And then finally, if you have Scent Life Summer Stories, share them. And again, I want to tell you, uh, if you have been working on a relationship for a while and you finally had some neighbors over or something like that and you started that relationship, that counts. Don't just think this is, well, you know, I shared, you know, the Roman road or we did a Bible study for 20 minutes, you know. Uh, those, those are great too. I'm not, I'm not slamming any of that, but I'm saying this counts. This is the relationship that's moving towards us. You're praying for them and the Holy Spirit is working and the Holy Spirit is moving. Many of you have heard me speak several times and you're like, Keith, you say the same thing every time. But I'm telling you, this is who God has called us to be. We can't just be hearers of God's word. We must be doers. And this is where the Holy Spirit is moving us if we'll submit to that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the love that you have for us. I thank you that you are a God that has chosen to not only save us, but to send us. Just as Jesus has been sent, we've been given the privilege and honor to be your instrument. To go into the world that you've created and show and tell the gospel in and through our lives. Father, I pray for each person here, and I pray for all the relationships that they right at this moment have in their life. I pray specifically for those that are not yet followers of Christ, that your Holy Spirit in each of us would just all of a sudden bring those people to our heart and to our mind, or maybe even help us to see those that are around us. Lord, the change that you have brought in us, the Holy Spirit, the mighty wind, the, the tongues of fire that have been placed into us as the Holy Spirit, we pray that you would just move us with conviction out into your world. That we would trust you, Lord, and realize we are simply the instrument as you that does the work. And so, Lord, guide us individually and together as your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.